I hope everyone here today takes something out home. Thank you. So delete, or oh, you can go ahead. Evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. So uh, I, I think this is the first uh, lecture of mine on Pico lasers. I'm a great fan of nano lasers. I've been using QSwitched for a long, long time. And uh, when Mr. Dilip asked me to talk about Pico, I said, I don't know about Pico. So he said, no, no, you can talk about physics. And I started reading about it and it got me very excited. Uh, and it is something which is not very commonly used in India, but it must be used henceforth. So I'll be talking on uh, a basic physics of laser. It's a purely physics about lasers. I'll not be sharing any clinical data of mine. Uh, the concept of selective photothermolysis using uh, a spe specific wavelength, specific pulse duration, and a selected chromophore changed dermatologic practice. And we have so many lasers now, which is entirely based on the principle of selective photothermolysis. Q-switched NDAG is the current gold standard for treating pigmented lesions and tattoo, at least in our part of country. And uh, whatever the conferences we are attending, whatever the literature we are reviewing, or whatever the uh, post we are reading, picocycle lasers with a pulse duration of 10 raised to minus 12 are fast replacing Q-switch lasers because of its safety, efficacy, and efficacy. What is the need of a new laser for a pigmented lesion? When you have a Q-switch laser which works in nanosecond range, the pulse duration here is 10 raised to minus 9. Uh, and most of these lasers now have a pulse duration between 5 nanoseconds to 20 nanoseconds. Q-switch lasers, we know they work on selective destruction of pigment by the photothermolysis. This selective photothermolysis, the sudden uh, shorter pulse duration of uh, Q-switch laser generates a shock wave inside the cells. And they have a little photomechanical effect in addition to the photothermolysis, the photothermal effect. Since the Q-switch laser works predominantly with thermal effect. We have to protect the epidermis in our type of skin, which uh, otherwise we will land in complications such as hypo or hyperpigmentation. And uh, since because of this, we have to be careful in choosing lower fluences. And since we choose a lower fluences, which results in prolonged treatments, frequent visit to the clinic, many a times incomplete clearance of the lesions. We say that it is 80% clears and 90% clears and patients want 100% clearance of the lesions. Or otherwise, if we are aggressive, we may land in complications. So if you see the basic principle difference between the Pico and Nano is not much in understanding the physics. So you have a laser light, which is absorbed by the target melanosome, depending on the selective photothermolysis, whether it's a melanosome or tattoos, which we are treating. There's a sudden increase in the temperature, which results in intracytoplasmic vacuole formation, which generates a shock wave, and there is a fragmentation of the target. The basic difference is here. The Q-switch laser we know works on the principle of thermal relaxation time. The time requires for an object to cool down to its 50% of the initial temperature achieved. In other words, it means that time that laser energy is limited to the target without spreading to the surrounding tissue and thus preventing the damage to the surrounding tissues. We know the diameter of melanosome is one micrometer and the TRT is 50 to 500 nanoseconds. Uh, and average size of tattoo is 40 to 100 nanometer with the TRT is one nanoseconds. And unfortunately, we do not have a laser of pulse, Q-switch laser with a pulse width of one nanosecond. And if you see, we if, if you can still further reduce the pulse duration, we can achieve this TRT in a better way and the effect will be more. To overcome that, Pico's worked with its, which which is a newer concept of stress relaxation time. And it is a time, it, uh, the stress relaxation time of the medium Q 
characterizes the time needed for a stress to propagate across the characteristic dimension of the heated area. In a simple word, the sudden rise in temperature causes a rapid large shock waves. We, we know that Q switch also causes a shock wave, but it the picoseconds causes a rapid large shock waves generating sufficient stress which is locked in the, in the particle. So it will not allow this stress wave to propagate into the surrounding structure resulting in fractures and disintegration of the particle. In shorter words, instead of being a photothermal effect, it, it is more of a photomechanical effect. And in both the lasers, the shorter the pulse duration of the laser, better and specific destruction of the chromochore. So we want a Pico laser with a shortest possible pulse duration. And currently the most uh, like Pico wave has a shortest possible pulse duration available of almost all the laser. It is around 415 picoseconds. So as, as we know, all laser tissue interaction includes a photomechanical effect. However, it is possible to generate a primary photomechanical effect without much of photothermal effect, which is surface palation effect to destroy the target. This can be achieved by irradiation with the picosecond pulse duration to generate a tensile strength which exceeds the tissue's ultimate tensile stress followed by a tissue fracture and fragmentation. This mechanism is extremely efficient, requiring much less energy to fracture a material via spallation than energy required to vaporize it. And that's why picosecond lasers are very safe. Ideally, a Pico laser should have less than 50 picosecond as a pulse duration to achieve the pure photomechanical effect, bypassing the photothermal effect. In practice, however, it is not possible right now because the plasma, which is going, which is I am going to explain inside uh, afterwards, is generated outside the skin and it can cause insufficient penetration or burn to the skin. They conducted a study where they studied the graphite, how tattoo reacts to Pico lasers. We, uh, the melting point of graphite is around 4000 degrees centigrade. In a simulation study, when a graphite particle was irradiated with 35 picosecond pulse, a temperature rose to 900 degrees. Now 900 degrees are much lesser than, four times lesser than 400, 4000 degrees. So the destruction of tattoo was not basically because of photothermal effect. However, it resulted in a cavitation bubble around the tattoo particle in the tissue without significant thermal expansion of the tattoo. So thermal, the tattoos are not thermally expanded. This rapid temperature spike in the particle resulted in a strong pressure wave, as I was discussing earlier, which is more than the tensile strength of the tattoo particle. And because of that, the tattoos get fragmented or the graphite gets fragmented. More important, it also altered the optical properties of tattoo, which is not an effect of nanosecond laser. It altered so, uh, which re resulted in the reduced, immediate reduced visibility of these tattoo. And that is why you get a faster clearance with tattoo combined with a, a small fragments and reduced visibility of the tattoos. So to compare with nanosecond laser, now if you see, this is a typical graph shown in Q-switch lasers. And we know that with a 20 nanosecond, any machine can go up to say 100 milligram and reducing it to just uh, 10 nanosecond uh, gets around 150 and five nanoseconds get 200 megawatt. As compared to that, when you reduce the pulse width to picosecond laser, you get a peak power of the laser in gigawatts range, not in megawatt range. And if you comparatively see the uh, difference between a peak power achieved by nanosecond laser, this is a five nanosecond laser, as against picosecond laser, the peak power is very, very high. And that's why these are very powerful but safe systems. And this is the classical histology of a Pico compared with nano. And you can see the basic difference. This is with 532 nanometer, 5.3. And again with 532 nanometer, 5.3 in a nanosecond pulse. Right? With Pico, with increasing fluence, there is a signet ring shaped keratinocytes. If you see the keratinocytes, there, the cytoplasm, there is an intracytoplasmic vacuole and the nucleus is pushed towards periphery, which is known as signet ring keratinocyte, with extensive increased vacuolization in the epidermis, because we know 532 acts predominantly on epidermis. The epidermal melanin is obviously reduced. And uh, there, are, oof, there are numerous round zones of laser-induced tissue injury uh, were found in the collagen bundle and depth of the injury correlating with the fluence. So more the fluence, more the depth uh, is achieved. 
the tissue, tissue reaction with nanosecond lasers, we have a, some perinuclear vacuolar changes and decreased melanin pigmentation, but without remarkable vacuolar tissue reaction in the dermis. And I'll come to this vacuolar tissue reaction later. Same thing is with 1064 nanometer. There is a signet ring keratinocyte with indentation of the nuclei, vacuolization of the basement membrane zone, large vacuoles in the epidermis and dermis. The melanin is completely fragmented and there is a dilatation of dermal vasculature. These reactions are very, very less marked when you use a nanosecond laser. So how does these vacuoles are formed actually? How does these vacuoles are formed and what is their importance? In Pico lasers, the laser induced tissue breakdowns. Vacuoles means you are breaking the tissue in the skin, not from the skin, on the skin. It, it is, you are just breaking it in the dermis and a part of epidermis without affecting the stratum corneum. This laser induced tissue breakdown is initiated by the production of free electrons during a picosecond pulse. The free electron density increases during the laser forms to form a plasma. Plasma is basically a, a fourth matter of a uh, universe like we know that it's basically an ionized gas with free electron by repetitive free electron generation this plasma is optically thick virtually color blind and that's very important and very efficient at absorbing energy in uh, remaining portion of the laser pulse so the effect is additive like uh, not, unlike a co2 where charred tissue prevents further absorption the threshold energy required to generate a seed of electron via multiphoton absorption without a chromophore is, is very high, a level that is far too high for the safe, safely induced human skin. But we have a chromophore where melanin and hemoglobin will act as a chromophore and the addition of absorptive chromophore generates thermal effect that exponentially lowers this threshold. So they can safely be used in human skin because of chromophores. The plasma energy is then transferred to the tissue via electron molecular collisions and the, the plasma ceases after the laser pulse. So it quenches after the laser pulse. The energy transferred from the plasma to the tissue generates an increase in tissue and water temperature very quickly in picoseconds, enough to create cavitation, large cavitation bubbles with large pressure gradients and that generates the vacuole. That gen destroys the, that part of the skin, creating a large vacuoles. Or, so you required one third to one half of the energy used in nanosecond laser. That makes them extremely safe. Nanosecond lasers break the Locke lesion to the pebble size, and whereas picosecond laser break them into the sand size. And we know that when treating a pigmented lesion, a pigmented lesion macrophages take away this broken pigment. The smaller you break it, the quicker macrophages can engulf it and remove it. So. It can be used uh, very safely and very effectively in treated pigmented lesion. All types of color actually can be treated if you can achieve a pure photothermal, sorry, a phototherm uh, mechanical effect than a photothermal effect. In practice, we see that although this is true, but it is still difficult to remove the green and the yellow with picosecond 1064 laser, but still they are effective, much, much effective than nanosecond lasers. It is also effective in green, blue, and yellow. When the nanosecond laser is irradiated, there is a risk that temperature is unevenly distributed as shown in the, this figure. However, when in case of Pico laser, the edges are neatly cut as shown in the figure, if you see. And if you can use a femtosecond laser, it will be still very sharp. But unfortunately, we do not have them clinically available yet. So what is the advantages of picosecond laser, what we heard about till now? They are very effective and safe in all skin types. They treat multicolored tattoos. They can treat epidermal and dermal lesions. So whatever the indications of Q-switch, they will be treated safely, effectively in less number of sessions. With all these advantages, PICO should be a laser of choice, but we have a limited number of indication and PICO lasers are expensive. We know that. However, there is, yeah, in, in, in previous sight, we, we have seen uh, intracytoplasmic vacuole formation, uh, intraepidermal or intradermal vacuole formation. And this property of Pico laser can be used to treat acne scars, traumatic scar wrinkles, or uh, which forms the bulk of our practice. Like in India, if you see acne, acne scars, traumatic scars, and pigmentation forms 60% of our practice, including the acne. Pico lasers, we know that can cause vacuolization of the epidermis and dermis. If we can fractionate the Pico laser beam, 
we can concentrate the energy at one spot create a controlled injury by producing laser induced optical breakdowns which is liob and this is the uh, a new type of fractional injury which can be created with pico lasers by using a multi lens array or a diffractive lens array multi lens array so i'll come to that what is multi lens array laser induced optical breakdown thus triggering plasma reaction and generation of growth factors cytokines and chemokines this is achieved by a diffractive lens array or a micro lens array to produce a focal increase in the fluence while maintaining the overall reduction in the treatment energy density so it is going to be safe but aggressive fractionation allows higher peak energies to be concentrated within the laser microbeam while sparing the adjacent tissue that we know so how does laser induced optical breakdown occurs ultra pulse duration and a fractional micro lens array which induces laser induced optical breakdowns within the epidermis and dermis there is a generation of plasma which creates intra cytoplasmic vacuole uh, intra epidermal and dermal vacuoles no tissue damage beyond these vacuoles these vacuoles are immediately filled with melanotic and cellular debris that transliminated uh, wound undealing process is started with release of cytokine collagen and mucin and you get new collagenosis and new elastic fibrin but the epithelial the outer stratum corneum and basal layers are basal membrane is preserved so less pain less thermal effect less complication and faster healing so less downtime that's an advantage of uh, uh, liobs so basically liobs is a new type of fractional injury without damaging the stratum corneum the skin barrier so we know that for scars you have a fractional ablative laser or a fractional non ablative laser and we also know that fractional ablative laser works best but they have a risk of complication here we have advantages of both we have a, a preservation of stratum corneum which is very important to avoid complications but we have a ablative injury in the skin in the epidermis and dermis so we have a safety and efficacy micro needling rf in my experience works in a same way but that that comes with a disposable cost you have to have a disposable cost and it will have hardly any effect on epidermal rejuvenation on pigmentation uh, pico uh, have both it will have a epidermal rejuvenation less in pig, uh, reduction in pigment and improvement in scar so this is a short diagram high power density multi photon ionization plasma formation which is expanded creates a shock wave creates intracytoplasmic vacuoles tissue is damaged and wound healing process is initiated and that's how liobs the laser induced optical breakdowns act and preventing stratum corneum and basal membrane so this i was talking about this diffractive lens arrays and micro lens arrays the point here is micro lens arrays are good because due to refractive properties of the lens attached by the mla energy is concentrated in each dot pico way has uh, mla as an optic however few lasers are doe they are good but mla is a recent advanced technology than a diffractive lens arrays so as as i told you fractional against hexa mla hexa mla is a brand name used by pico way and the fractional lasers has hot rejuvenation there is a thermal abrasion you required multiple sessions there is no lot of downtime and there is a destruction of stratum corneum as against this it's a cold rejuvenation it's a plasma in worked by plasma induced cavitation and if you see the treatment is fractional with is sparing the normal skin and the stratum corneum is always preserved you can have epidermal rejuvenation and dermal cavitations which is which can be controlled with fluence the depth can be controlled with fluence we know 1064 can go really deep so uh, it it is a wonderful tool to treat scars and this is the end point of ml treat uh, mla treatment now if you want to treat a scar you have to achieve a light, little bit of purpura if you want to treat a large pore uh, you have a moderate petechi and if you want to treat it as a toning which is not possible to do with a diffractive lens array you require an mla toning uh, micro lens array for a toning or skin rejuvenation the end point will be mild petechi which heals within a day within a, about half day so uh, so this is a new type of fractional injury i mean i i like the concept of this fractional injury very much 
had sub epidermal ablation preventing the outer layers of epidermis more pronounced response in pigmented skin less downtime as compared to the fractional laser there are lots and lots of published studies coming up on acne scars surgical scars and wrinkles so if you see now com comparing the cost of pico wave it's it's definitely expensive but it will show you about two machines if you compare a cost of good fractional co2 or a fractional rbm yag and a cost of non ablative laser or a q switch laser and if you combine this machine can achieve both the indications like you it will achieve the in a better way uh, the indications treated by q switch laser and the indication treated by fractional lasers it can treat variety of condition like pigmentations tattoos toning for regeneration and melasma wrinkles scars even it is approved for anicomycosis so the possibilities are unlimited and one should definitely consider pico way in their practice thank you pico care in their practice thank you thank you dr swapnil now could we have the first poll please listening to him dr gold all right let me get my let me get my stuff ready for you thank you very much and welcome to everybody and um mine won't be a long talk but i just want to share with you um certain things let me just back out for a minute with um one tech for a long time and um the the um the, the this um this device has really been a, a very useful addition to um, our clinic and what we do on a, on a regular basis. So um, you can all see my screen, right? Delete, you good? Everybody good with this? Um, can, can you see my screen? No, we cannot. You need to save the screen. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, Pico, and I'm going to, um, you know, let you know, as I said, that I've worked with Wantech for a long time on on their devices, and um, the concept that you heard that that was one of the best physics lectures that I heard I've heard in a while on all of this, and I think that um, we are looking. When we talk about Pico and Pico Care, we, we sort of sort um, look at the concept of um, where does this play a role, and um, how do we make it fit into our practice? Because as was mentioned, we are all very well versed in the nanosecond technology, and the, the there's no question that. Q-switch nanosecond technology works. Um, what makes Pico different is the technology is, is much more advanced, as you heard, um, being able to create these um, laser optical um, injuries into the skin. And because of that, the device, the treatments themselves for our patients um, appear to work much faster. So in my practice, if we were treating somebody and said, told them it's gonna take 10 Q-switch, the reality is it should take four or five at most with Pico. Um, and that's really good. So I think that, uh, the, and again, the history of Pico, um, it, these were developed to treat various color tattoos. Um, and in India, you may not have the same kind of problem that we have in the United States um, with the number of tattoos, but we have, a, we have a huge amount of tattoos that we treat. Um, there's something called tattoo regret, which is a very big part of my practice, um, where patients pre-COVID would go out partying on Friday and Saturday night um, and then show up in my office Monday morning going, what did I do? I got a tattoo over the weekend. I don't remember getting my tattoo and I need to have this off. Also because of some social um, in, uh, things that go on with people, um, you know, a, a tattoo that's visible sometimes stops them from getting employment. 
um, stops them from getting promotions, stops them from being in the right social situations. However, having said that, there are people that love tattoos and if they want their tattoos, that's fine. Um, but we're in the business of removing tattoos. Um, the other comment that was made about if you want to just in your mind think when you think pico think of that one slide that was shown that you know you have a rock nanoseconds produce pebbles picosecond lasers produce sand and as was noted sand is much easier for macrophages to remove than pebbles so that's why it works so much better um and in anything that we're treating so the concept of um, tattoos was the number one reason that picosecond lasers were developed. The advantage with the Pico Care is they have hand pieces that are designed that we can treat every tattoo in a very successful way. So you have you have special hand pieces for the very difficult colors, um, and that's really nice. So it almost is like a targeted approach to the blues and greens. Um, which we have never had before, and that's really important. However, having said all that, um, the because, and again, it was mentioned, the cost of these devices is not cheap. Um, PicoCare is much better positioned in the market than some of the other ones, but they they are they do come with a cost and. Um, you can work with your local people on, on what that cost is. But um, we also then said, okay, what other things based on the science that we heard and you've already heard about, where else can we use these devices that make sense? And so pigment became the second indication for these devices. And we were able to successfully show with all the different PICOs and Pico Care as well that using the device, pigment goes away really quick. Um, again, nanosecond lasers makes pigment go away, but not as fast as the Pico lasers. Um, and so the most difficult pigment goes away rapidly in most every case that we have. So this is sort of in, um, a slide that shows the different things that we can use this with, um, the, you know, which is really nice because, um, again, in your countries, you may have more of one thing than the other. So you see a lot more of the Nevis of Odo and Ito than I might, might see in my practice. Um, but I see as a dermatologist, as you mentioned before, acne scars is, is, is what I see a lot. And you know we have lots of great treatments for acne scars or tr even traumatic scars. Um, and yes, you can do your ablative and non-ablative fractional lasers. You can do microneedling. I think it's important in the post-COVID world. Um, I am open for my practice as you are in India now. Um, but I think we're all taking a little bit of a, what are we not doing in our practices yet? Um, and we're not doing anything ablative or any needling procedures at this time. It's just not something I'm ready to do um, post COVID. So um, my PICO patients are, are, are coming front and center because we're using for our, ac for our acne scar patients and our traumatic scar patients and our laser toning. Um, this is the device we're using the most now. So um, I think that's great. And then as, as was mentioned, when you put a micro lens array in and you can up the power and you can lower the, um, and you can make the these things work even better through almost like a fractional Pico, which is what I always call it. So I think that we have all these indications. Um, and as you said, and you, you know, um, when you saw that slide of, of, of that poll, um, pigment is your big concern. Um, and again, for things like melasma, which we cannot cure, but we can surely treat. Most of my melasma patients, I start immediately on PICO. Um, all my lentigines, all my freckles, um, those kind of things. But I think, again, when you look at it, it's tattoos and pigment. I do a lot of tattoo work, um, and, I, and I think that's good. So when we look at tattoo again, you know, this is the kind of this is the kind of chart that you love to see. 
um, because we've always been able to treat the black and browns and, and, and you know, pretty simple to treat, uh, um, you know, the, the, those kind of things. It's the, it's, the, it's the colors in the green and blue um, that are really hard to treat. And so, again, we have special hand pieces that are designed for this, and it makes it very nice for our patients um, to be able, you know, to be able to say, okay, well, I can treat multicolor tattoos. I can treat all kinds of tattoos, um, and that's important. And again, when we have these benign pigmented lesions, whether it's epidermal or dermal, um, we have scar treatments and skin rejuvenation. We, we have designated hand pieces that work that allow us to successfully treat what we're trying to accomplish. So it's not unheard of, um, again, to, and, and I sometimes will use um, some, I, I'll use like the five, the 1064 for my melasma, and then I'll switch hand pieces at times to do some collagen toning and remodeling. So um, I think you can sort of start to get aggressive, sort of play with the machine, understand how it works. And yes, the cost is higher. Yes, I charge more than I do for nanosecond technology when I do this, um, but my results are faster. So in, in, in essence, my patients um, are much happier. The other thing that I'll mention with tattoos, one of the problems that you have when you treat tattoos and tell patients it's gonna take 10 or 12 or 14 visits to make the tattoo go away, they'll do one or two or three and then they stop. And that's a problem um, because I don't want them to stop, but they, you know, they, they don't, sometimes they don't wanna continue the patient. So having a machine like PicoCare where we can get them in, get it treated, get the, result, the positive results that we're looking for helps us tremendously um, at, in, in what we do. So I think that's really important um, for our patients and for you um, who are looking to get the best results um, from what we're doing. So again, I, I'm sh I wanted to show a couple of different cases. Some are, my, some are not, these are not mine, but I will show you mine at the, one of mine at the end. But I wanna show you the settings and how we sort of set up the machine um, you know, with the, and again, we can make these slides available to everybody uh, to leap if they want them as far as settings. Um, but you see here, again, can you do this with a lot of different machines? Sure. I can use an IPL. I can use a thulium laser. I can use a Q-switch laser. Um, but the, if you look at the skin texture following the treatment, it's really nice. And so I like using these kind of things. And again, this is laser toning. Um, with a 1064 um, handpiece, and you see the other settings here, um, you get very nice clearing and very nice toning of the skin. So again, this is what we do with our patients. Um, I also always mention that when we do these kind, this kind of work, we are using um, skincare associated with it, um, especially post skincare and sunscreens, which I think are very important. Um, but again, this, this, this works really nice. And again, you, you see the Nevis of, of Ito here, this bluish color um, a, with very nice clearing here. Tattoos, again, work really nicely. This is almost like a hypertrophic tattoo. Um, and, and you see the, the improvement um, that you get. And you also note before, this person had some other treatments, probably excisional work um, or some other lasers. And one of the things that I learned early on um, and I, I, I didn't put this in this talk. Um, I have had lots of people that have had lots of Q-switch treatments and we get to a certain point and we can't get it even further. And what I've found with Pico is I can then use Pico once or twice and, and get, um, get it. And here, here's one of my cases again, um, you know, this, this has, um, this is three treatments. This is about a month after the third treatment. The pain is finally gone from this guy's, this, this woman's uh, feel my pain. I don't know why they would put that on there. Um, but what happens is as well, the skin tone, the skin color all will come back to normal. Um, and the end result is usually, um, you can't tell that that tattoo was there. So they asked me to share um, settings that we use. 
Um, there are guides that tell you what to do um, with each one of these. Um, I, I put these charts in, again, not to, to spend a lot of time with, but just to let you know that if you have epidermal lesions, we can use our 532. If you have dermal lesions, we can use our 1064 Pico. Um, and again, with the various spot size, fluence, and the frequency, um, again, tattoo, permanent tattoos um, are a little bit different, but again, you, you can treat them um, with this. And again, toning, whether it's melasma, PIH, um, you can treat, you gotta be careful. Um, most PIH goes away on its own, but if it's been there for a long time, I'm not afraid to use the Pico laser on this, but melasma is a great indication um, for this. And again, with the fractional treatments as well, pores, tonings, and acne scars um, work really, really well. So if you've never um, used Pico, this is the kind of device um, that I would encourage you to, to use. Um, I, I encourage you to, to learn more about it because I think that um, over time, um, again, at this point in time in our lives post, COVID and hope that we don't have a spike in our post-COVID, we need to do things that are going to be safe, not only for you, but for the patient. This is safe for you and this is safe for the patient. Um, we're not going to really worry about anything in the air when we treat with this device. Um, the, the physics of this allows the breakdown under the skin. And again, as you saw, it bypasses the stratum corneum. So this makes it exceptionally safe at this point in time. Um, and I think that's just makes everything um, really nice. So I'll turn it back to you, Dilip, um, or. Yeah, Dr. Rajeta. I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Dr. Gold and Dr. Rajeta. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. It was uh, very fascinating to hear right from the master from the horse's mouth. Now we have the second poll. Could we have that, please? On the screen? Yes. Dr. Rahul, would you be taking us through it? So, uh, most common use treatment for acne scars. Uh, in our current practice, fractional lasers, MNRF, surgical modalities, substitution or uh, TCA cross. That's the first question. Uh, how frequently do you do you see face complications while treating uh, acne scars such as SOB and uh, optimal results or pH less than 10%, less than 25%, 50% or more? The third poll is how frequently does the downtime or pain prevent from patient going ahead with the above modality for acne scar treatment? Uh, rarely, sometimes or frequently. I think we'll have another 15 to 30 seconds for you all to vote for all the three questions. Uh, 15 seconds more, then we will end the poll and show you the results. Uh, while they're answering, I think there are requests regarding uh, voice clarity. So just check it. Sir. So uh, the first question uh, we have uh, fractional uh, laser, uh, fractional CO2. 53.3% people who are using fractional razor. MNRF again 50%. Surgical modality uh, very few, 4.3%. Subcision uh, TCA cross 28.3%. Uh, with regards to face complications, uh, less than 10%, 44.6% uh, people. Uh, less than 25%, 38%. 50% or more, 17.4%. Uh, and regarding downtime, rarely is 22.8. Sometimes is uh, quite high, actually, 67.4%. And uh, 
9.8 is frequently so i think uh, sometimes uh, gives you fair bit of idea that it does have downtime and uh, decreases the repeat uh, visit of the patient so can that. i can i pipe in real quick so so this is an interesting poll because again in the in the in the time we're living in the united states i don't know anybody doing fractional co2 right now it's sort of not being done i'm sure in india same way from what i'm hearing um, i'm not doing any micro needling rf and i'm not sure anybody that i know is at this point either um, and, and when you look at the third question about pain and downtime, PICO has very little. And the PICO care is, you know, is, is that, again, shows the, an advantage for why I want to use that, especially now. Thanks. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rajita, over to you. Uh, if you have any comments, or we can continue. It's very interesting to see that uh, Two-thirds of people are shying away from the classical acne scar treatments because of downtime or pain. And it makes sense because how many of us want to sit at home or can afford to sit at home for four or five days each time with the casting of CO2 laser. But Dr. Gold, in India still we have uh, the fans of uh, CO2 lasers refusing to give up. I have switched over to MNRF and I guess Dr. Swapnil has as well. Dr. Swapnil, would you like to comment on those things please on the poll? Yeah, it's 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 right. I mean, uh, what what the energy we are using with frac CO two is not really achieving anything to the scar. We are not actually treating the scars. We just are rejuvenating the skin. I mean, we are just treating it. It's, the effects will be similar to the uh, uh, TCA pill. I mean, you get a downtime, you'll get a rejuvenating skin, but scars are going to be there because. Most of us are using low sets of energies. We are using very less densities as compared to what is being recommended. And we're using very less energy. So definitely my treatment of choice was or is microneedling RF right now for acne scars. But as Dr. Cole said, we are really, really worried about it right now because of the COVID. And I am at least personally not using neither fractional CO2 nor microneedling RF for treating scars. So, yeah, I don't want to see any blood right now. That's really one of the main reasons I'm doing it. So I'm not doing it. So, um, and again, for acne scars, I was part of the FDA studies here for acne scars with PICO, um, and we know it works. So again, another great time to be using our PICOs. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. So uh, now we have uh, 42 minutes left. And I'm planning to take around 10, 12 minutes to take you through the Indian experience and to show you a few pre-posts on Asian skin and a few tips from my own uh, experience. And I request all the listeners to keep posting in the Q&A. We will come to that. We have a panel discussion right after my talk, which will be no more than uh, 10, 12 minutes or so. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I think this is the time for me to tell you all that I'm hugely honored. We have uh, viewers from 28 countries, uh, 200 people from uh, across the continent watching. And uh, it's a huge honor to me to be speaking after Swapnil Shah and after Dr. Gold. Uh, both of them gave beautiful talks. And I, for, for the first time, realized that somebody can make laser physics so fascinating. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Swapnil. So uh, without further ado, I will get to the point straight away. Now we understand that it is a game changer for skin of color. We understand that you can get away with lower fluences, with less risk of PIH, with less downtime, with less pain. And uh, I decided to divide this short talk into these headings. Uh, I'll show you a little glimpse of the Pico Care 450. Talk a little bit about indications for skin of color because for us tattoos are not really a big thing and how we adjust the parameters because most of these parameters have either come from the West on Caucasian skin or they've come from the Far East, which again has much lighter skin than what we see in India and Southern Asia. I'll show you a few uh, Indian peoples and a little bit of take home regarding treating pigment prone skin, which we tend to have a little bit on the advanced uses of uh, Pico Care and then we go on to the question and answer. So coming to my conflict of interest, I use the company owned Pico Care for trials. I speak for multiple laser companies. And to be honest, I don't own any machine because I 
take care of this chain of clinics, which uh, has many machines and we don't own a P4 either. So I am not going to really go into this just to stress the fact that because you have such short pulse width, such short pulse durations in uh, around 450 picoseconds, you are able to confine the, uh, the trauma, the mechanical trauma to where you want it to be. You are not getting into the dermal diffusion mode. So uh, Dr. Swapna has already spoken to you about the stress relaxation time. I'm not going to go into that. He's shown you all these things. So uh, regarding the DOE versus MLA, that as well. Now, one interesting thing that I wanted to show you, typically we struggle with removing yellow pigment. So this uh, Pico 532 acts pretty well on that. And also it's interesting that to remove green color, you actually don't need an Alexandrite. You can get away with this, though this particular machine does have a dedicated uh, green handpiece as well. It has a 660. So uh, now you have multiple studies. The ones I have included here were the ones that have used this particular machine, not the other machines. And I don't need to tell you again that it is effective uh, in multicolored tattoos, particularly because you have two additional uh, wavelengths available, 595 and 660. And uh, you typically get away with uh, lesser atrophic or hypertrophic scarring. And also when we are treating dermal pigment, typically we tend to see a lot of lichen planus pigmentosis, a lot of pigmented cosmetic dermatitis, or even things like nevus aporta. We end up with the confetti-like depigmented spots that are a nightmare to treat. So a pico laser would have far less risk of PIH, but then PIH we're not really scared of, but it is the depigmentation that we are scared of and that is uh, typically quite less with Pico lasers. And of course, you know that there, uh, you do get faster results and the efficacy is better with much less risk of mortal hypo or even depigmentation. Now the Hexa MLA, which is the USP of this particular machine, you've seen how it uh, focuses the energy and it can give you 15 times the energy that is available in Zoom handpiece. I see a few questions in the Q&A section where people were asking, should we use this in a melasma? Should we use it for rejuvenation? So I'm going to tell you one basic thing here. So basically, things like melasma, you want to tread very, very gently. You don't want to injure the melanocyte so much that it kind of reacts and uh, produces melanin on a rebound. You want to be very gentle. So there you actually want to use either just the zoom or MLA in a very, very low fluence. Whereas if it is collagen that you're looking for, be it acne scars, be it uh, uh, rejuvenation in terms of open pores or fine lines or even static lines, that is where you're going to have the maximum benefit of this focused energy of the MLA. I have set a time up I, and I'm going to skip these. Uh, we know that is excellent for inducing collagen while keeping the stratum corneum and the uh, viable epidermis safe. This I'm, you've heard already from the master, if I may say so. So these are the hand pieces that are available. The zoom hand piece has spot sizes ranging from two to 10. You also have a collimated hand piece and I, I'm a big fan of one, the carbon peel, and second, microneedling radio frequency. And I did use it with a lot of carbon as well in the initial days. Uh, but I later on kind of gave up because I realized that I was getting that kind of a rejuvenation even without the carbon with this. Now, the dye hand pieces, you have the 595 and the 660 nanometer, both available in just the three millimeter spot size. And you have two fractional hand pieces one with a spot size of three to five, which is the one that we use for your acne scars or your chicken pox scars, and the six to 10 one, which we use for rejuvenation. This you've already seen. So I'm not going to tell you about this, this repetition would be meaningless. So a typical parameter that you would use would be something like half to one third of what you would use with your Q-switched uh, machine. But please do a test patch every time. Don't go just by the calculation. 
Now, once in a while, you might end up with a slight textural change, but believe me, this is not that. This is just the edema that you see immediately. And even here, you see that there's a slight hypopigmentation, which would typically blend, but this was the result on a professional tattoo just after two sessions. And I thought this is pretty impressive. These are not our pictures. These are from the Far East, from Korea. And you can see the very nice skin rejuvenation and improvement in uh, certain kinds of scars, but something like this, this is where I would still want to do a bit of shouldering and then do my Pico laser, honestly. Because if I'd done my shouldering, then the leveling up with the Pico laser would have uh, given much better results, if you ask me. So things like uh, lentigos, you do get good results. And I see that there's a lot of interest in uh, solar lentigenes from the Far East attendees. So we will discuss a little more about the parameters there. So even for red tattoos, typically when you use your Q-switched 532, you tend to have a little remnant sometimes, but you can get away with that. So to avoid that, we used to combine another fractional ablative laser on top of the Q-switched laser. With this, you don't actually need to do that. This is a beautiful tattoo, very interesting one. And you see that though it is mainly red, very little is remaining after very few sessions. And you see the improvement in uh, skin texture and the acne scars. Sorry about that. So here you see a pickled kind of a melasma could also be a acquired bilateral nevus of Ota, which has improved quite well. And again, a combination pigment melasma with uh, some amount of lentigenes there, which has done well. And yes, the freckles have done well. The faint melasma has practically disappeared. So uh, one important thing, even when Pico second 532 was used, uh, on Asian skin, PIH was encountered in up to 10% of people, but then all the PIH did resolve in three months' time. And hypopigmentation also was encountered, but in a far lesser number. And the uh, interesting thing here is that these lentigenes did clear in a single session in 60% of the people, which is uh, uh, something that is very, very encouraging. And uh, coming to this paper, they found that melasma responded in four and a half sessions uh, on an average, obviously. But, but that is not something that, that I'm going to uh, promise my patients. And this was with the 755 Alexandrite. This is a comparison of various Pico lasers in the market. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But what I want to draw your attention to is one, the pulse duration of uh, 450 and also the stable beam profile in addition to the excellent uh, hexa MLA fractionated handpiece, which makes it ideal for inducing LIOPs. So coming to indications for skin of color, I'm going to take maybe two, three minutes more, not too long. So one, for us, tattoos are not a big indication. We have very few tattoos. So we have very little tattoo regret. So we cannot really buy a machine that will mainly get us money from the tattoo removal. So we count on rejuvenation and yes, in Indian cities and also in, uh, in the second tier towns, like Dr. Swapnil Shah's experience shows, we have enough of a market for rejuvenation. People want to look good. They are willing to spend the money. And if you are going to assure that it is painless, that nobody else can make out something was done, it could be done during the middle of a work day or something, and uh, it is safe, then people are willing to spend. Now, a huge market for us is skin lightening. I hate the word fairness. And uh, we struggle with topical steroid abuse for skin lightening all the time, not just me, all Indian dermatologists know this, and I'd be interested to know how many other Asian countries also have the same problem, but I would be surprised if they didn't have it at all. So skin lightening is something that we can achieve very well with this in a safe manner without resorting to, God forbid, a steroid combination or even a hydroquinone in the long run, and acne scars. So, so far we have moved on from fractionated CO2 laser to MNRF and now I guess this is the 
next stop for us. We in South Asia do see a lot of dermal pigmentary conditions like lichen planus pigmentosis. We actually do not really diagnose ashy dermatosis so much, but we do see a lot of pigmented cosmetic dermatitis. And now the umbrella term for the, all these entities is acquired dermal macular hyperpigmentation, AMDH or ADMH, uh, whichever way you address it. And uh, we find that no peels work here, no topicals work here because the pathology is the dermal melanophage. So, uh, so far we were managing reasonably well with Q-switched uh, YAG 1064. And now that we have Picolase up, I think uh, it is time to move on. And macular amyloid, I have a few pictures for you to I'll show you how it works. And Neva in dermal melanocytosis, like Neva's of uh, Ota and Ito, we don't have as many as the Far Eastern people, but we do have our share. And if there's something that's going to uh, uh, treat these in fewer sessions, because lots of times we end up doing 10, 12 plus sessions and still there's a faint hue of the dermal grayish pigment left. And if we can do that without creating mottled depigmentation, then what better do we want? So important a message for all my Indian colleagues is that you're going to hear a lot of talk about 532 wavelength. For us Indians, darker skinned people, 532 is an extremely dangerous wavelength. So I personally use it only for red tattoos. I use it for junctional melanocytic nevi, or I would use it for freckles in very fair skin people. So if I have a Punjabi or a Kashmiri patient who actually has a Type 3 Fitzpatrick, that makes sense, 532, but otherwise I would be extremely scared of it. So even for epidermal lesions, I would much rather use 1064 wavelength. And I'm going to ask Dr. Swapnil what he thinks about this. Now, so an important uh, point here is that you uh, treating skin of color with any laser is basically a tightrope walk. So you don't want to use too little so that you don't get any effect or you don't want to use too much because you're going to end up in PIH. So you want to stay on top of this tightrope with a very balanced fluence. And how do you get to the balanced fluence? By understanding your machine, by doing a test patch for every session. And also, one of the important things that leads to complications, be it in PICO or Q-switch laser, is stacking. So if you're going to use the ideal pulse repetition rate. So if I'm doing a tattoo, sometimes I do it in one hertz or two hertz. But if I'm doing near the eye, then I'm going to do two or three hertz. Whereas I'm doing a low fluence laser toning, I'm going to do it in 10 hertz. So that is important. Also, avoid overlap, especially if you're treating dark pigment, air cooling if you can, and uh, pre-treatment, post-treatment, steroid creams, I personally do not like. If I have to, I will give it for the first 48 hours because using a steroid cream in the post-procedure period is going to delay healing. It might reduce the collagen that you're trying to induce. So I am not a great believer. And as, as some of our Indian patients tend to abuse steroids more than use them the right way. So I'm a little wary of that. And uh, sunscreens, pre-treatment for priming, test patches, and individualized jot down every time so that next time you know how much you've used. And I have a particular interest in the periocular area. I'm going to show you a picture also. So, uh, if you look at the analysis of what causes dark circles, the most common finding has been dermal melanophages. So if you can master the art of inserting a metallic eye shield, and if you can do your pico laser, then nothing like it. So. Uh, many of these pictures are not mine because of lockdown. I could not access it. And my experience also has been for a limited period. So many of these are courtesy Dr. Rajendran. So you can see that the freckles have lightened, but you can also see the beautiful textural improvement. This is right after one session and you have the parameters there. So you will see that this was with 1064, not with 532 for a freckle, which is an epidermal lesion. And uh, this is a Nevis of Ota. He, and this was the lighting that he got after three sessions, though I am personally comfortable treating Nevis of Ota at two or even three months uh, rather than do it every six weeks. And this is a, a tattoo which is lightened reasonably well after three sessions. Again, Dr. Rajendra. Now, this is a beautiful color improvement, which my patients would love more than the improvement in the acne scars, though you can see that this person had very tough acne scars to deal with. And uh, this was a standalone treatment with uh, this particular Pico laser. So I would say I'm quite impressed with this. So here the MLA was used and uh, 
what I would do for this particular patient is I would stack these scars, do a double stack, and then I would do a overall rejuvenation uh, MLA using either a seven or an eight a millimeter using a far less fluence. Again, an older person, you would not think that his skin is capable of producing so much of collagen, but then he's done beautifully. And also his PDL has reduced the pigmentary demarcation line and the skin is lightened very nicely. Same person. And this is uh, one of the people who works with us in our corporate office. And uh, he's had many of these. We didn't want downtime and he's done very well. And this was after just two sessions. So he had these box set scars, which also surprisingly did quite well. And this was a lady who could not go through even microneedling RF or any other procedure because she has a very bad tendency towards PIH. So I managed to treat her with uh, just two sessions on her acne scars. I wouldn't say it's a great result, but it's not too bad a result. And this is again, Dr. Rajendran's uh, photograph. After one session, the PIH has responded quite well. This seems like a FDE to me, the fixed drug eruption. It's responded beautifully. And uh, his post-acne marks also have lightened significantly. And this is again from Dr. Rajendra, the combination of red and uh, uh, black tattoo, which have lightened. And this is after around uh, three sessions, if I'm uh, right. And again, his experience with a uh, large complicated tattoo using the L532 so that you stay safe. And again, I match your tattoo there. So this is one of my patients who after one session just observed the kind of light reflex that is there on his forehead. So there's no Botox, no filler. And this is something that's very attractive for me for rejuvenation because many of my patients are injection phobic, even if they can afford it. And uh, I want to bring your attention to the macular amyloid deposit there, which is practically faded off. You can see the rippled pigmentation in this photograph, which you can barely make out after this. So these were two sessions done uh, roughly uh, eight weeks apart. So I uh, just did two sessions and that was about it. Same patient, another view. These are Dr. Rajendran's pictures. So after two sessions, this patient's melasma did beautifully and he used the zoom handpiece under fluence of 1.1. And uh, this lady is done even better. Her melasma was faint. This is again to see Dr. Rajendran, but I want to draw your attention to this very important slide. Remember that eventually all melasmas become mixed, which means that it's very attractive to have something like a Pico laser, which can tackle the dermal pigment in melasma. But remember that these pendulous melanocytes are very treacherous. So if you hit them hard with a high fluence, then they're going to become dermal. So you might actually end up making the melasma worse by using high fluences. So remember in melasma, thread extremely gently because below you are the pendulous melanocytes. I wanted to draw your attention to this very old paper, but very impactful paper. So which showed that most of our periocular pigment is actually pigmentary demarcation line. And just look at the depth of the pigment in this pigmentary demarcation line. It is so deep. So what kind of a treatment would work other than a pigment laser. And now that we have Pico laser, uh, this is what I would want to. So a few take home points for you. Important is to talk about how much sunscreen to use in spite of me drilling it into my patient's heads that they need to use at least half a teaspoon for their face and neck or at least two and a half teaspoon of uh, fingertip units for the face and neck. They managed to use a 50 ml bottle for two, three months. Now don't ask me how that happened. So I monitor every time. I also use, find this extremely useful, the scale that tells you, not just from their skin color, but how they tend to develop the edge. So this was a patient of mine who was wearing a glass bangle. She had a minor, minor scratch. And this PIH was photographed two years after the incident. So if you have patient has a skin like this, you want to know before you start the treatment, not after. And for such people with bad Robert skin types, I would certainly want to use this. And this is a favorite trick of mine. I used to use a lot of tranexamic acid in the post-treatment period too. And I'm talking about oral one to reduce the chances of pH. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Gold about his experience with the newer wavelengths, 595 and 660. His experience 
in periocular area on nails in children because neosophota now they say is going to respond in fewer sessions if you start treating them early and i read this beautiful paper where the youngest child was around one and a half years or so and of course his ex experience in depth on uh, the use in rejuvenation so i'm going to show you a few pictures of its use in various kinds of nail dystrophies and the melanonychia and uh, all none of these were actually fungal uh, the, they were not onychomycosis so they the investigators had uh, done scrapings and koh mounds to rule that out and uh, this was how after five treatments the nail transformed and i would say this is a very uh, attractive thing for us to pursue though i have not used it on the nail myself and again another melanonychia especially for men who can't pay, paint their nails so so in summary i would say it is quite safe faster outcomes and ro is something that you need to work out but uh, like dr swapnil says i guess it can be worked out now this is something that i did using my q switched machine this was after two sessions i used a corneal shield and i used a conventional q switch yag a fluence of around 6 with a spot size of 5 and i layered it with my fractionated erbium and this was after two sessions this lady had uh, lichen planus pigmentosus so if you can do something like that faster then you will have to put the corneal eye shields uh, less times so i have a few questions for the uh, for my two panelists dr gold and dr swapnil so i will go on to that but before that i am going to take a look at the audience questions as well so there are many questions and uh, we have around 18 minutes left and i'm supposed to have a poll as well so can we have the poll now can dr rahul do the poll yeah yeah i'm going to stop the share so what of the below mentioned criteria Uh, will be critical factor in deciding the purchase of a device like pico care the price uh, its multi utility uh, multi indication utility the quality or or all of the above uh, the second poll question is uh, are you guys uh, interested in purchasing the pico care device whether yes or no or you need more info information that is you are undecided yet uh if you are deciding uh how soon would you want to purchase it uh whether you are uh, interested for a demo of a pico care 450 and uh, whether you are interested in upgrading the pico care another 20 seconds we'll stop the poll and we'll move to the panel uh, discussion and question and answer okay so we will end the poll now and share the results All right, so uh, we will move to question and answers, uh, panel discussion, and question and answer. Okay. Thank you. So shall I initiate it, Mr. Meswani? Yeah, yeah. And uh, for all the people who want to ask the question, please use the Q and A because that is more easy for us to answer and uh, strike it off that we have answered the questions. Okay. So I am yeah. going to start with the very first question. Yeah. Uh, this is for Dr. Michael Gold. Uh, 
Dr. Gold, Dr. B wants to know, can you clarify the depth of cavitation caused by LOOB? Is it dependent on the spot size of the fluence? It's dependent on both. So, I mean, the larger the spot size, the deeper it's going to penetrate, and the, and the more fluence that you use, obviously, the deeper it's going to penetrate. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's every laser. And so spot size and fluence determine the depth, so. So it is both. Okay, so is melasma better treated by the zoom handpiece or by the MLA? Either, so you can do either one. Um, and so I, I tend to um, start with the zoom handpiece um, if I'm trying to get a, and if I want to get more aggressive, then I will use the MLA. Um, but I usually start with the Zoom handpiece. Zoom is uh, gentler. Now, yes. always combine it with uh, lightness. I presume he's talking about the topicals. Yeah. So we. So again, I, I'm. I'm a big. You know. I. Th I think that one of the things that dermatologists are really good at is skincare. Um, I think that you know, we're, we're trained in, in, in how these things work and what we do. Um, if our patients are going to have any of these procedures, they have to have a skincare routine. Um, so um, it's built into what we do. Um, you know, I always ask what they're on, what they've been on before. Um, sometimes, you know, they're on the right things. They just need the laser to add to it. And sometimes they're on things that don't work and, or they've been on it for a long time and it hasn't done what it's supposed to do. And we will, we will adjust their topical things. And then everybody has to be on the sunscreen too. Dr. Swapnil, may I ask you to add this? Now, I know you've not used PICO, but you have enormous experience treating melasma. So... Combining lasers, uh, using lasers in the treatment of melasma, what pointers would you like to give to the listeners? Tough question. So, so uh, I, I'll be honest in this. I'm using Q-switched for melasma, but of course it's a third line of treatment. When everything fails, I offer a treatment to the patient, explaining them that it can also fail. And they have to wait patiently for five to six sessions to see some improvement. So when, when the topicals do not work, when chemical peels do not work, and if the patient is still with me or he has come trying everything uh, with me, I, I advised Pico. The results are all or none. I mean, if it improves, it improves wonderfully well. If it doesn't, there is no change. So you don't get a partial reduction in melasma even with a Q-switch toning. I mean, that's very honest. If, if it improves, it improves to a great extent. And if it doesn't, there is no change at all. And that's what I found. So I'll be very, very cautious. I, I used Q-switch only in the compliant patient who understand what I'm speaking. And it's not a blanket treatment for all. I mean, uh, I, we have to choose melasma very carefully. The patient very carefully, I mean. And, and I, tell my I tell my patients, treating melasma is like walking up a staircase. We're gonna start at the bottom with our topicals. Correct. and our peels and then we're going to add in some other things that that we do when you do your q switch you're using low fluence right right yeah yeah I, 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 wrote, I wrote that paper about almost 20 years ago on on the use of, it was a device called the i think it was called rev light and we and we, we were we were the first group to report this low fluence Thank melasma you. treatment and i think part of the problem is that people think we could cure melasma and again, none of us can cure melasma. But if it takes you six or seven or eight treatments with Q-Switch, you can do it in two or three with your Pico care. So that's why I like Picos. But again, it's not a cure. Yeah. Thank you. So they need to be on screen religiously. And I love using oral sanexamic acid. Maybe because by the time somebody reaches me, the melasma has become very chronic, very old, and developed a lot of vascular component, which is evident even with the naked eye, thanks to the steroid usage. So, uh, Dr. Gold, do you think higher fluence with hexa MLA is better than low fluence for scars, pigment, fine lines, wrinkles? Dr. Carol wants to know. Yeah, so, so again, I think that when we get into the scars and, and again, um, those kind of things, 
rejuvenating the skin. Um, I like using the micro lens array treatments, the, the hexa treatments much better. So fractional Pico um, for that has, has sort of taken over um, the non-fractional world. So, um, you know, again, when we did the work for the FDA, it was taking these fractional hand pieces and, and showing how successful it could be by doing by using them. And again, for scars, you need to have a higher energy, much more densely packed the, the, that the fractional Pico gives us. So would you do 532 for Asian skin? Dr. Kelvin Lowe wants to know. So you talked about, you know, the 532 is a dangerous wavelength for Asian skin. Um, so honestly, the one of the studies I actually did was I was, we were the first office to do 1064 and 532 at the same time in the same day on Asian skin. Um, so nobody had ever used the Pico to treat acne scars like that. Um, and so we were very nervous, but again, the combination worked. Um, so I'm not sure I would do 532 by itself, but I used them in combination. And I think you're right, 1064 is much safer. Um, so if you don't have to use the 532, um, you know, then be careful, um, you know, but you, 1064 works well. Okay. So would you recommend uh, MLA setting for skin reju rejuvenation for pore size or overall wrinkles? Would I use what? Say it again. You answered that. That's fine. So how are the results in melasma compared to Q-Smith? You said uh, fewer sessions. Um, definitely fewer sessions. So again, I always tell patients, whatever, I tell doctors more than patients, whatever you do in nanosecond, half, do think one half, and that's what PICO should do. So what are your parameters for melasma? Um, so again, when, I, when I'm treating, when I'm treating melasma, um, you know, I, I like to use, um, um, 1064, a, 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 you know, anywhere from a six or seven millimeter um, size handpiece or spot size. Um, fluences are around 0.8 to one, um, t about 10 hertz. And I'll, I will do up to two or three passes on these patients. Yeah, I would do exactly the same. But if I have a dark melasma, because my dark melasma is much darker than yours, then I would go even lower on the fluence. I would do something like a 0.6 to 0.8 but usually around 0.8 to 1 is, works well for uh, Indian skin as well. So uh, what, what is the use for the collimated handpiece? Do you ever use it, Dr. Boat? Which, the collimated handpiece? Not really. No. Okay. Now, would you use the dye handpiece for acne? For active acne. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, I, again, I, I have done it on a couple of occasions with really good, I, I have a lot of machines for acne. So um, I, I think that that the dye hand piece would work really well for active acne. And again, if you have it, I think that's worth trying as well. Uh, so would you say that the results would be encouraging or early days yet? Um, still early days yet, but it's encouraging. Now, what about the post-acne erythema, the redness? Um, so the again, red, redness work, redness with this works really works really well. I mean, you you can definitely um, um, again you use um, the laser toning um, type of treatments um, that work really well with that. Um, but again, you you can use it because 1064 does treat does have a um, vascular um, indication as well. So again, I'm, I wouldn't hesitate to try it on that either. Okay. So uh, Dr. Selene wants to know what parameters I would use for LPP and the acquired dermal macular hyperpigmentation. So I divided into two categories where I have a lot of pigment and where I have a faint pigment, which is residual after the medical treatment with isotretinoin or cyclosporin. So where I have a lot of pigment, I would use a spot size of five millimeter or four millimeters. And I would use fluences of around uh, three or so to anywhere between 2.5 to 3.5. And if it is the 
faint residual one, then I would do the laser toning mode. So I would use anywhere between six and eight millimeters spot size, and I would stick to fluences of around a one to 1.3, 1.5. So Dr. Michael, how would you treat a patient who comes with faded eyebrow tattoo color from black to red brown? With eyebrow pigment, eyebrow tattoos? Yes. Not so so I'm, I'm, I'm always nervous about treating eyebrow, permanent um, tattoos, permanent ink in eyebrows um, because um, sometimes you, you end up difficulty, especially if there's white into, in, that, in that region. So um, I'd like to do a test spot um, and, and again with my 1064 and just sort of see what happens. But you have to be careful because some of these eyelid, eyebrow tattooing, at least in this country, um, are, can give us a lot of problems. Um, so it's like my least favorite thing to treat. Okay. So onychomycosis special post care, there is none. Basically, you will uh, want to make sure that the matrix is not involved. Otherwise, uh, without a oral antifungal like a troconazole, you will have a recurrence. But if it is only the distal involvement, then the lasers work beautifully. So what is your maintenance advice post optimum reduction of mixed pigmentation like melasma or macular amyloid? Dr. Saha wants to know. And so the maintenance advice would be an excellent skincare regimen along with a night cream regimen. So the night cream, I personally like to alternate a retinoid with a skin lightening agent like a alpha arbutin or sometimes even a plain glycolic acid 10-12%. And uh, Dr. Swapnil, would you please take this? Because this is from India. So what kind of a maintenance advice would you give your patients once their melasma or their macular amyloid is uh, resolved? Okay, so... Uh... If uh, when the melasma reduces, I mean, to a significant extent, I generally switch it over to a topical tranexamic acid combination with kojic acid and vitamin C. I ask them to use a sunscreen. I explain them that melasma is not gone. It is just suppressed. If you, don't, if you don't care enough, it will come back in no time. So I just went to a beach. I just went to out uh, went outside to pick up my kid. Are no excuses to wear a sunscreen. You have to wear a sunscreen, and and you have to wear a sunscreen with a visible light protection. That's that's often ignored in our part of country. So uh, it's best to use a sunscreen and topical tranexamic acid, vitamin C, kojic acid. This is a simple regime which I ask them to follow with, of course, a physical block. I mean, where, wherever you can use a scarf hat, cap, whatever you can use it, and that's all. I have no experience of treating macular amyloid with any of the lasers. I mean, I tried so many things. The post-op is always bad than the pre-condition. I mean, uh, so have you have you have an experience of macular amyloid treated with lasers? I mean, I am not very happy with any of the lasers. Right? I do like I to use experience about It is these extensive ones, and I, I do use it in combination with Colchicine. Okay. And, I've, and I don't, and I don't have any of those cases. Thank goodness. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So the women have it easy. Makeup contains ferric oxide, which is an excellent blocker of visible light. It's one area where we have a clear advantage. Dr. Sushma Ravi wants to know: Can we use it in acanthosis nigricans? I'm going to answer this. I'm obsessed with insulin resistance in acanthosis nigricans. So AN is not a pigmentary condition. It is caused by the thickening of the stratum corneum and the papillomatosis. So you're far better off giving them metformin after determining what the HOMA IR is and doing something like a sequential peel, a TCA followed by a Levon retinol yellow peel therapy is my personal favorite. Now, Dr. Aruna Kashyap wants to know. Is Can, I I Can I just, I'm going to be back in, I'm going to be back in one minute. I've got to go see somebody really quickly. So I will return in one sec. I have my mask and I'm ready to go. Uh, yes, yeah. So, so uh, acanthosis nigricans, as you rightly said, it's not a pigmentary condition. Of course, you have to take care of the metabolic profile of the patient. But what I have learned or read from Pico, the diffractive, the MLA, the microlens array, would be a good choice to treat it. I mean, 
if you can treat wrinkles and scars with an MLA, you can always treat an acanthotic screen. Uh, this is my first suggestion. I mean, you should try it in acanthosis nigricans, of course, not as a monotherapy, but because we are not targeting pigment with MLA, right? No. We, we are ta targeting uh, skin thickening with MLA. So that that is an exciting indication to try it. And I'll add something more, like uh, Dr. Gold was talking about trial of 532 and 1064 use. Uh, there's a recent publication in Journal of uh, Laser Medicine and Surgery in 2000, uh, January 2020. It's, it's very recent. And they have treated type 4 or type 5 screen, uh, skin with a combination of 532 and 1064 with MLA, uh, the microlens array. Combination. Sorry? Yeah, combination in one so session. Was it, what was the indication? Rejuvenation? Is Acne scars. Acne scars. Okay. Acne scars. And they found it is extremely safe and extremely effective. And there is a logic behind it because uh, when you see the histopathology, the slides which I have shown, the LOBs, LIOBs, and the tissue reaction is very, very pronounced with 532 than with 1064. Yes. So if you, if you can take use of that property, you are obviously going to get uh, a good results with 532-1064 combination in acne scars. And I was very happy that Dr. Gold has used it and he tried it a long time. This in paper is in two tw January 2020 in laser medicine and surgery where they treated type, type 3 to type 5 skin with combination of 532 and 1064. So if you can get the hang of using a very low affluence to create a much more a uh, disruption in the upper dermis, right. then your acne scar is going to respond well. So, uh, now uh, I'm not going to go on about uh, acanthus nigricans, but if it is stratum corneum that is the problem, then a peel is going to just remove the whole thing. But remember, it's going to come back if your metabolic problem is not treated. Now, Dr. Anurag wants to know, can I elaborate on oral tranexamic acid dosage? So, the standard dosage is being 250 BD. I personally like to give 500 OD uh, in a sustained release formula, but uh, there were these old studies which gave better results, which had used anywhere from 750 to uh, 1000 milligrams. So for patients who are heavier, after I go through the checklist, after I make sure they do not have a high tendency of uh, coagulation, I don't mind going up to 750 a day also. And uh, for post-op care, so for post-procedure, if I want to use oral tranexamic acid, I would initiate it on the day of therapy and I would give it at least for a week or 10 days till the complete healing has happened. But this I'm talking about the old school, the fractional lasers. If it is PICO, then I don't see myself using the oral tranexamic acid. What, so Dr. V wants to know, what if melasma becomes worse after PICO laser? What is the next step? Using laser again at low energy or trying other modalities? Dr. Gold. Um. Melasma, if melasma gets worse after you do a series of these treatments, it means the patient's in the sun, the patient has done something counter of what you're telling them to do, not protecting them themselves. So lasers always work. Um, they may take longer, um, but if, if a patient with melasma gets worse and you're active and there and you're doing your laser, your pico care, your good skin care, your oral transemic acid, and they're getting worse. A, you've got to look at other endocrine issues that may be going on that might be causing it. Um, but you also need to check that they're actually doing what they say they're doing. I've had patients that have had, you know, reactions to whatever I've done. And you know, no, Dr. Gold, I didn't do this. And no, Dr. Gold, I didn't do this. And yet, you, you know that you know, later on if you find out that they did do what they weren't supposed to do. Um, and that's my biggest problem with um, all of that. Okay. So uh, if a patient has PIA, what parameters would you use with the PICO laser? Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation? Um, so again, PIH, the nice part about PIH is that it usually goes away over time. You should want it didn't, but they usually do. Again, I, I would do a 1064 spot size of around six, keep the fluence about 0.8 or 0.9, um, a frequency of about uh, 10 hertz and maybe um, up to two or three passes in these people. Um, that usually um, takes care of it. 
But again, it's a series of treatments. And, and again, if you're doing PIH, I'm also using lots of topicals as well. So Dr. Budiman wants to hear Dr. Michael, which is the choice of handpiece for treating blue and green tattoos? And what do you do for for, for blue and green? Yes. So again, I, I think what we, we're, we're lucky we have these, um, um, you know, the, these, these dye hand pieces. So the blue is 595, the green is 660. Um, you know, th those, those are the main things that we don't have with, a, you know, um, a lot of other peak, especially with other picos. Um, some have a third hand piece, which sort of allows you to try to do both colors. Um, but this has separate hand pieces. So again, I like it like that. Okay, so what do you do if you have a blister after the tattoo is treated, right after treatment? Would you um, expect a blister after tattoo treatment? With you any no, you don't expect it. Um, sometimes you see some blistering. That means you used a little too much fluids probably. Um, I, I, you know, I've been known to put a hydrocolloid dressing on those patients for a day or two, just to calm it down. Um, people always ask, do you pop a blister, you know, open it up? You can do that if you want. It's not gonna hurt anything. But again, I put a hydrocolloid dressing on and let it heal that way. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Isaac, uh, no laser treatment should leave a blister. It is not normal for blisters to happen after tattoo treatment, even with a Q-switch laser, and forget about Pico laser causing blisters. Now, Dr. Gold, uh, some laser companies say that Pico lasers cannot bleach the facial hair. They, that they cannot bleach facial hair? Yes. So why, uh, what is the logic there? Because we know that Pico care does bleach facial hair quite well. Um, I don't use it to bleach any kind of hair. So I'm... No, you don't. <laughs> but can, uh, so if you have dark colored hair and you're doing your laser toning there, yeah. Your hair is going to get bleached if you do the Pico care? I, I mean, I've never seen that. So here, okay. and at least in my patient population. So that, that I don't have any experience with. Okay. So I do a lot of that. And uh, Pico care is probably the only Pico laser that I have used where you can actually get a good hair bleaching. So it is not necessary that uh, a true Pico laser does not bleach hair. But that talk has been around. I'm not sure why that, that is there. And so basically, if you have a high enough power and you're able to cavitate the hair, would it get the hair bleached? Obviously. Probably. Dr. Swapnil? I, I don't think so. It's, it's, see, if it is acting on a pigment, it is going to bleach it. I mean, it has to bleach it. It has to. Otherwise, it's not effective. Exactly. <laughs> so if you're going to break up pigment in the hair, just like you get a frosting, would you have hair bleaching? Of course, you should have it. So or, you just, or you just get old like me and your hair bleaches. So. <laughs> you have, we have dark hair, so we start. I used to have dark hair. I used to have dark hair. <laughs> okay. So another 10 minutes, uh, Mr. Mameswani says we can take. So I'm just trying to see the. I, I've got to. I've got to get to my patients. There. There. Oh. I have. I, so I. You. Know, I can answer one or two more questions, and then my 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 one team is screaming question. at me. One last question, Doctor. Sure. Uh, so for periorbital darkening, any recommended parameters? Any uh, session recommendation? No, not real. I mean, again, I think I, for me, so the 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 periorbital darkening. Is a is an interesting concept um, because we're learning so much about it. Um, you know, as as far as um, you know, is it is it true pigment? Is it vascular? Is it a mix? Um, and so I, I think that again, because Pico can cover pigment and has a vascular component. Um, I, I think you know, and in your in your skin color versus mine, I would use a 532. You're going to use a 1064. Um, I think that again, if you do it correctly, um, you know, using um, um, you know using the 1064, keeping you know keeping the fluences um, in 
I would keep the fluences in 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 the in the lower range, uh, you know, in the one to to, to one point two or something. I would keep it lower. I know some of the pigment you might go a little higher, um, but I would go. I would keep the fluences down. Um, I would treat these people every month to six weeks, and I would just see how they respond. But again, I would all I would I would absolutely use topical medicines at the same time. Um, and again, darkening, you've got to be careful because some darkening is not just with pigment. It's, it, there's other, in, there's other reasons why people are getting pigment around the orbit. Yes. Including a volume loss. So, uh, one last thing, we are tips for acne scar treatment using the pico laser and then you can we'll, we'll say that again, the say the question again, no, your tips for acne scar treatments using pico care. I, I love acne scar treatments with Pico Care. Um, I think I, I, I get, um, so. So when I when I'm doing when I'm doing um, any kind of the the scarring, um, you know, I'm going to use at least. Uh, first of all, I'm using the fractional hand pieces, 1064, and and I'm and again, um, I'm using a little bit more energy up to three, and and I'm doing at least two to three passes. If they'll tolerate, definitely two, and if they can tolerate a third, I probably will do a third. And you do the same thing for box cars and ice cars as well? I'm um, sure. So, um, yeah, the, the, the old adage in dermatology is you can't treat ice pick scars. I think I've demonstrated enough through some papers that, you know, these machines, if you do this, you're going to get improvement. You may not make everyone disappear, um, but you're definitely going to see improvement. So, um, ice pick, I'd like to use Pico, box car, box car, a little harder, but most patients have a mix of scars. So they have a little bit of everything. So I like using this and then seeing where we get after two or three treatments and then adjusting therapy as needed. Okay, so your spot size favorite would be three millimeter? The three millimeter, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So Mr. Meswani, Dr. Gold has to leave. So I have, I have to go, everybody. So I, I thank you for letting me participate in this. Um, keep asking your questions. You've got experts here that can answer anything. Um, and if, but if anybody has questions, you can obviously, to me, Dilip and, and anybody from OneTech, they all know how to find me. So um, I want to thank everybody for letting me do this, okay? Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Gold, for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Thank you, ciao. Yeah. Uh, we have a few questions. In the next three minutes, we will wind up. Is that fine, Mr. Meswani? Yes, go ahead, yeah. Okay. So, uh, somebody wants to know how complete resolution of pigment in macular amyloid. I've been lucky a few times, but my endpoint is usually around 80% clearance, and I've been able to get there with uh, quite a few patients. Now, Dr. Uh, Dr. Swapnil, I'm going to ask you one question, because... Uh, I have not read about this. Can PICO be used for stretch marks? I have not used it. But technically, going by the LIOV yes, concept, it, what it, do you think? I think it, it's going sense. to be safe. Yeah, it makes sense. Can't, can't hear Dr. Swapnil. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, uh, to try it yeah, using a stretch mark. Anyway, stretch marks are difficult to treat. If you treat it with an ablative device, uh, you're going to land up in PIH in our skin. So, we want something which is non-ablative and effective. So we can treat it with a micro lens array. So far, my favorite is the MNRF. But I, I've become very unfaithful to MNRF of late. <laughs> so so, so that, that's probably a good idea, Dr. Mega. But uh, early days, now can we treat hyperpigmented lichen planus marks with this? See, once the lichen planus is inactive, it is like a dermal pigment. So you can pretty well treat with this, and most of us have done it with a Q switch. So no reason why PICO would not work. Would you agree, Dr. Swamnal? Yes. yes. Post LP pigment? Of course, you have to take you have to make it sure that LP is not active. Active, because you can cognorize, you can make it worse also. So uh, now Dr. Mandy Ian has misunderstood. Pico cannot repigment. I said Pico causes less depigmentation. Yes. So somewhere some misunderstanding is there. So if somebody comes with hypopigmentation post Q switch laser, any tips for them, Dr. Swapnil? Sorry? Hypopig hypopigmentation post Q switched? Uh, okay. 
So, uh, and it's very common. I mean, so the, you can get two kinds of hyperpigmentation post Q switched. One is confetti like small macular hyperpigmentation, hyperpigmentation or a depigmentation. That's when you are very aggressive with your treatment, especially common with when you use a smaller spot size. So, uh, there's a wonderful paper published by Dr. Chandrasekhar, and I'm using that all the way. You can use a modified TCA cross. I mean, you just use a lesser percentage of TCA. Uh, at around 60 to 70 percent, just touch the uh, depigmented macule with that, and you will get repigmentation, and that's that's pretty successful. The other type of depigmentation or hypopigmentation you get in a large macule. Suppose you are treating melasma and you inherently injured things, or you, if you are treating a tattoo and you cause a burn and you'll get a depigmented macule. Now, for that, you can use topical tacrolimus, and I always combine them with an excimer light. The monochromatic excimer light and that do well with uh, these kind of hypo or depigmentation. So I do pretty much everything that Dr. Swapnila said. In addition, sometimes I use a very gentle, pure ablative erbium to do the same thing that the TCA does in a much more controlled manner. So we've all been there, we've all done that, but the ideal way is to prevent it. So be careful with your fluence and your pulse repetition rate. And uh, any Tips that you would give Dr. Swapnil for choosing test parameters for a test patch. Do you advocate a test patch? No. 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 Because, see, uh, especially tattoo, yes, you can no. use a test patch. I mean, yes, you can use a test patch. But for other pigments, because it's not a uniform pigment, you do test patch at one end and you try it on at other other side, it's not going to be helpful. So, uh, what I what I believe is to follow the treatment chart given by the parent company in, in, in your initial days because that's the safest parameters that they have recommended. And once you get an experience and when you get used to the nitty-gitties of the machine, you can gradually try experimenting. Uh, that's the way to go. I mean, uh, whenever somebody asks me for the parameters, you should not follow the parameter by anybody else's on anybody else's machine or different type of skin because what I am treating is not going to be treated by you. So it's best to follow the guidelines which is given by most of these companies. And uh, it's very important to have a histopathological studies available from these companies because somebody asked me how, what is the lay, uh, depth of LIOBs? It, it not depends on what parameters you are using, what, which machine, the, the no two machines are same. So whatever the histopathological studies done on one particular machine may, is not relevant or valid in this machine. So to know that, you have to have a, a good histopathological study at different fluences, uh, which has been done with that particular machine. And that will tell you at what depth. And it's not only the depth of the LIOBs, the, the tissue reaction surrounding it is also important. So yeah. considering that everything in picture, it's best to follow the guidelines which are given by the parent company because the guidelines are designed based on the histopathological studies. Also make sure that you pay attention to the tissue reaction. Now even in a tattoo, you, you actually have to end up doing multiple test patches. You have a red ear, a thick, fat, black ear and a thin black line somewhere else. So you'll probably have to do that. So till the time you understand your machine, you know, you'll get to a point where you know that this is fine. But till that point, you can increase your parameters slowly. So I guess this is the last question. Now, melasma patient, which, uh, which laser would I use for melasma patient after a lot of counseling and after a lot of uh, under-promising, I, if I have access to a pico laser, I would use it. But after I do my oral transimic acid, sunscreen counseling, everything, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for having me here, Mr. Meswani and the team One Tech. I guess it's time to say bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajita, Dr. Sapnil. It has been really great webinar, very educative. And uh, we, we have uh, still 125 attendees. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Jenny, Esak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll leave you. Thank we tried you. to answer all the questions. One last thing. I hope you're not thinking that test patch and patch test are the same. They're different things. Because one question just popped up. So patch test is something that you do one time so that you, your patient knows what to expect. Test patch is, you know, you try out the fluents and... Simple you know, that patch test has no role in lasers. Patch test, we've given up. 
So it's not no, even no, medical no, legal. No, 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 Right. Patch taste is used to determine the contact sensitivity of a particular <laughs> allergen, right? No, but there are some questions here, and uh, laser patch test for hair reduction are extremely common. So people keep oh, asking us. Patch. But once in a while, you know, for see, I don't mind if somebody before signing up for full body laser hair reduction wants to get one underarm. I don't mind. But tattoo and all is that's not the. You know, to see how hygienic you are. how competent your therapist is that's a different story altogether so all the best and thank you so much for viewing uh by mr vesman thank you thank you very much bye sapnal thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you thank you goodbye bye any last words that's it that's it yeah thank you bye good night bye good night <laughs>